This is Professor S. K. Paul, H.O.D., University Department of English, B.R.A., Bihar University, Muzaffarpur. Dear students of PG Semester 3, for CC 13, Unit 5, Section P. Dear students, uh, good morning to all of you. Today I am going to deliver my lecture on uh, on the topic uh, comparison between Yates and Eliot in following uh, myth and mysticism. Yates and Eliot are generally supposed to have uh, um, Yates and Eliot are generally supposed to have had little in common either in their thinking or in the manner and style of their work uh, I indeed it is generally assumed that they were at best chary uh, of each other and at, at worst antagonistic. This view has been powerfully put by uh, a poet who knew them both uh, as close friends uh, in a letter of 21st of November 1957, Ezra Pound wrote to George Yates, uh, W.B. Yates's uh, uh, deceased wife, uh, W.B. Yates's wife, sorry, W.B. Yates's wife, Ezra Pound to George Yates, my benevolent speculation, not res retrospective but uh, as uh, in uh, insemination was uh, as as to whether T S E T S Eliot and Uncle Wim didn't tend to bring out of the worst of each other or at least uh, neglected to develop a uh, mutual illumination. Since yet uh, Uncle Wim had by this time had been uh, dead almost uh, uh, twenty years. Uh, in in uh, in it might be thought that pounds uh, speculation could not help but uh, uh, but be retrospective but his description of it as as insemination seems to suggest more fertile possibilities even that uh, he considers he considers uh, he considers the relationship between uh, two of the greatest poets writing in the twenty in the twentieth century uh, is still pregnant with possibilities. Later critics they have almost uniformly agreed with Pound's estimation that the two writers were suspicious uh, or hostile towards each other each other's work. Although uh, although it is conceded that. Uh, after Yeats was safely dead, Eliot's attitude towards him softened, and that he made amends with a noble commemorative uh, lecture in Dublin in 1940, and with uh, the inclusion of Yeats as a significant element in the compound ghost in his last great poem, Little Gidding. Reading the newly available letters, between both poets as well as hitherto uncollected articles and prose suggests that the relationship between Yeats and Eliot was more complex and less antipathetic than has been hitherto thought and uh, and I want to argue uh, that under an apparent uh, indifference or lack of uh, mutual illumination the two Two men were not only far more conscious of each other than is generally recognized, but that ironically they were more alike in their in their thinking or at least in sharing common concerns in their thinking than they were like pound. Although he impinged more obviously and boisterously on both their careers and there is his implication in Pound's uh, very words his regret is not that uh, his regret is not that uh, his regret is uh, not uh, that there was uh, no mutual illumination between Yeats and Eliot but uh, but uh, but that such a potential illumination uh, regrettably lacked uh, sufficient wettage uh, 
so that it did not refract uh, and reflect uh, as brightly as he thought it could and should have done. In this sense, it is worth exploring just what was mutual in the two poets illumination and in what ways they might be said to have neglected to develop it and we might remark the we, we might uh, we might remark that as in the case of matches and flint illumination may be generated generated from fiction fiction as such as from recognition and acid Eliot, Ulysses, Order and Myth, The Dial, 1923, 83. The attitudes of both uh, Yeats and Eliot to their age and their art was deeply, uh, deeply uh, inflected, I inflected both in theme, theme and practice by philosophical, religious and social anxieties uh, uh, that had uh, <clears throat> that had incubated in the 19th century and these anxieties uh, preoccupied them more agonizingly uh, than they did uh, than they did pound joyce or windham levis writers usually numbered with them as the major modernists if as is now fashionable we see the modernist movement as a reaction to modernity as a realization as a realization that the secular ethics and clear thinking of the enlightenment had not only failed to deliver the earthly paradise but had in fact begotten a world of fragmentation and uh, entropy then Yeats and Eliot can be said to have addressed this condition from the outset of their careers in both cases the perception led them to seek meaning in what Eliot was to call the immense panorama of futility and anarchy which is contemporary history and yet more succinctly. The, um, uh, the preposterous, the preposterous pig of the world in seeking to find meaning both were drawn uh, if from different directions and with different conclusions uh, towards what was for them a central mystery, a comprehension of the implications of logos which Eliot eventually understood as the Christian, as the Christian incarnation and yet uh, as a real orthodox uh, process of sometimes violent incarnations, supernatural in, uh, eruptions into the processes of human history. Yeats was already an established poet of 49 in 1914 when Eliot arrived in England uh, for what turned out to be a permanent residence. His radical change in style and theme increasingly evident after he had cut down of his uh, uh, stilts at the turn of the century was unmistakably registered in his uh, book responsibilities of that year. In fact, that Pound understood but Eliot did not. Indeed Pound, if not the cattle Catalytic influence some critics have claimed certainly encouraged yet to be bolder in his poetic experiments. He also exerted an important influence on Eliot, but again as in his dealings with Yeats, this was less in converting him to new forms and styles than in encouraging him to preserve and develop the poetry he was already writing. Pond at once understood the precocity and individuality of the 26-year-old Eliot, understood uh, recalling later that he was so poetically gifted as to have evolved 
his own modernist style apparently uh, by himself. This very self-fashioning -fash kept Eliot aloof from Yeats, whereas Pound had arrived in London five years before him, eager to become a disciple. Dorothy Shakespeare recalled in her journal that in February 1909, he talked of Yeats as one of the 20, one of the 20 of the world who have added to the world's poetic matter and uh, read a short piece of Yeats in a voice dropping with emotion uh, in a voice like Yeats's own. Eliot needed uh, uh, no such addition uh, to his uh, to this uh, to his poetic matter the first annual Yeats's lecture although he has acknowledged in a lecture delivered shortly after Yeats's death Yeats was already a considerable figure in the world of poetry when he began to write he could not remember that his poetry at this stage made any deep impression on me because as he went on to explain the poetry he needed to quicken his consciousness only existed in France. For this reason the poetry of the young yet hardly existed for, for me until after my enthusiasm had been worn by uh, the poetry of the older Yeats. And by that time, I mean from 1919 on, my own course of evolution was already determined. The Letters of T.S. Eliot, Volume 1, 1898 to 1922, uh, edited by Valerie Eliot and Hugh Houghton, London, Favour and Favour. If not influenced by Yeats, Eliot was from early in his English career, keenly aware of him and within a few months of his arrival in Oxford, uh, engineered a meeting. In February 1915, he intimated to Pond that he hoped to make Yeats's acquaintance uh, and Pond, who had recently acted as uh, Yeats's secretary, took, took the hint and brought him to one of Yeats's famous Monday evening gatherings probably on 8th of March. Thus, by 4th April 1915, Eliot could report that he had had the pleasure of meeting Yeats. He is now in Ireland. He is now in Ireland. He went on, but I am hoping for him to return. He is a very agreeable uh, talker. It is probably that uh, the two bumped uh, into each other reasonably often over the next few years, particularly given, uh, given their shared friendship with Pound. There is evidence, for instance, given their shared friendship with Pound, there is evidence, for instance, that Eliot attended uh, um, uh, one of the exclusive one of the exclusive performances of uh, Yeats's first, uh, first no play at the Hawks Well in London in April 1916. On, on, the, on 2nd of March 1917, he was constrained to curtail the pleasure of Yeats's agreeable talk by the invention of a popular novelist when, as he reported, in a letter to Eleanor Hinckley, he found himself at a gathering of a curious, a curious zoo of people known as the Omega Club, Omega Club, and was sitting on a mat, as he, as is the custom in such circles, discussing uh, psychical research with William Butler Yeats. The only thing he ever talks about, except Dublin gossip. When a red-faced, uh, sprucely dressed man with an air of impertinent prosperity and the aspect of a successful wholesale grocer 
came up and interrupted us with a, a most disagreeable cockney accent. I was so irritated by the man that I left for another part of the room almost at once. Later I found out it was Arnold Bennett. Despite his striking if uh, uh, un carbonucular resemblance to a small house uh, agent's clerk. Bennett was later to go out of his way to trip to help Elliot. And since he sometimes attended uh, sciences with uh, Yates, was probably genuinely engaged by the uh, conversation on, on, on this occasion conversation on this occasion, it is also quite possible that Eliot was uh, uh, genuinely interested in it uh, in, a, in an interview after Yates' death. Uh, he told Richard Elman about these discussions and Elman assumed that uh, he had been bored by them, although in the light of his warm response to Yates, Yates in 1915 and the fact that he began a preview of Per, uh, per Amica, Per Amica Silentia Luna in 1917 with the observation that it was always a pleasure to have Mr. Yates's talking. It is far from certain that this was the case, but if not wearied by Yates's fascination with the psychical research, he was uh, on philosophical grounds suspicious of it and, uh, and also of his resource uh, recourse to folklore and myth in addressing metaphysical and theological questions T.S. Eliot's, uh, uh, Eliot's from collected poems and plays. Part of his disquiet was prompted by perception, perception that they were both troubled by the same questions in his very first published essay, essay an article on the poetry of the Irish writer Sir Samuel Ferguson which appeared in October 1886. Yeats had extolled Ferguson's heroic style as offering an alternative to what he describes as, uh, uh, as that leprosy of the modern tepid emotions and many aims. Yeats, Yeats from the very first opposed in his art and criticism what he saw as the psychological and social torpor induced by modernity and the consequent undermining of traditional social and religious beliefs. It is significant uh, that shortly after moving to London in 1887, he articulated his uh, increasing sense of alienation with the very allusion that Eliot uh, was later to employ uh, in the wasteland. Writing to his Dublin correspondent, the poet uh, Catherine Tinan, he complained that many of those he met uh, reminded him of, his, uh, uh, of the lost souls in Nathes Inferno, consigned there, consigned there not because they had committed they have committed any great sin, but because they had made the grand refusal, uh, they had failed to anything virtuous. Thirty-five years later, Eliot was to identify these souls as the uh, quotidian denizens uh, of his west land, the crowd following over London Bridge, so many I had so, so many I had not thought death and undone so many, size short and infrequent were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet. The allusions, as Eliot remind us in his notes, are to the first circle of the inferno. <laughs>
and it is this crowd so which set the moral tone of his poem not great sinners not great sinners for great sins as he argues in this essay uh, on bodlier require require energy and audacity but the trivial and the venial represented elsewhere in this work by proof frock and geronsian and the hollow men yet prescribed as the antidote to the leprosy of modern and heroic form of poetry based on myth and legend and in the 90s he was fond of citing not as eliot as eliot misrepresented him matthew arnold's assertion that poetry was a criticism of life but william blake's more robust and positive insistence that art was a celebration of life and that all arts uh strove to bring about the golden age again and here we strike on a fundamental differences between yeats and eliot both were haunted by the prospect that the world may be absurd in so far as it has no purpose that history is merely a process of endless repetition but whereas yeats uh, yeats definitely definitely sought to redeem the world through the imagination eliot took it as Uh, took it as the inevitable consequence uh, of the human condition human condition a state which following the conversion to christianity he could associate with original sin in a thoughtful essay on yeats on yeats and eliot george fraser argues that the crucial difference between the two is that eliot is a christian yeats was not there is much truth in this but we need not to remind ourselves that eliot was not always a christian and that his form of theology was based on attitudes and perplexities that preceded the, his conversion conversion these perplexities overlapped with those of yeats who was certainly not indifferent to christianity so that while they are search for answers that would satisfy them differed markedly the origins and motives of their quest were markedly similar yet this concern to counter the leprosy of the modern and its many aims was grounded before 1900 in his attempts to find what he called unity of being through unity of culture in a poignant passage in autobiographies one uh, one to which significantly significantly eliot uh, significantly eliot uh, returned on a number of occasions yet laments that unlike others of his generation he was deeply religious but deprived of the uh, simple minded religion of my childhood by the post darwinians he made a new religion out of poetic tradition and that uh, uh, this tradition was steeped in the supernatural if yet says predicament uh, was not uh, as untypical as he alleges of one born in the mid 19th century and thus inescapably inescapably uh, the ire uh, of uh, darwin and german german higher criticism his reaction to it was uh, uh, less issue eliot would uh, later change him with trying to promul- promulgate uh, what was essentially an individual and idiosyncratic religion but this was far from the case on the contrary no matter how orthodox the direction the directions it may have taken yet says search for faith 
yet says search for faith always included uh, a search for authent uh, authentication in the Tibetan authorities Madame Blavatsky, Blavatsky claimed for her um, claim for her uh, form of theosophy in the supposed uh, uh, Rosicrucian or uh, hermetic origins of the golden golden dawn in medieval mysticism and uh, uh, Gnosticism and in later life uh, in the study of the Upanishads. Moreover, in his interest in theosophy and the religious uh, and the religions of India, um, India yet was anticipating in a less uh, rigorous and less uh, scholarly uh, fashion. Eliot's purpose in taking academic uh, uh, courses on Eastern religions at Harvard, like many of their generations, uh, both sought enlightenment from the East, and Eliot was propelled to take these courses because he was seeking what Yeats was seeking. Both in their youth found themselves cut off from the faith of their childhood. In Yeats's case, this was the orthodox uh, uh, Protestantism of the Church of Ireland. For Eliot, it was the Unitarianism of his family, a creed which denied the Trinity, questioned the divinity of Christ, and tended to convert issues of good and evil into conflicts in rational ethics. So, if Yeats was, as he supposed, unlike others in his generation, in being very religious, he was not unlike at least one person in the next generation, that is to say Eliot, both were deeply uh, unsettled by the inroads science had made into a religious belief in the 19th century. The higher criticism of the Bible uh, had challenged the orthodox account uh, account of creation and the divinity of Christ, while natural selection seemed at its most re deductive to deny life uh, any purpose beyond mere survival. Yet for all his uh, denunciation of Huxley and Tyndall, whom I detested, Darwinism was not the major factor in this process for Yeats, who readily rejected social and political evolution, evolution for, for a historiography, a historiography based on sudden uh, revolutionary or counter-revolutionary change. Nor was it for Eliot, who was the who was to dismiss post-Darwinian uh, uh, meliorism as a partial fallacy, partial fallacy encouraged by superficial notions of evolution and override it with a view of history as a pattern of timeless movements. Rather, both men were anguished by the loss of the uh, uh, numinous, uh, the reduction of life to drab secularism by those scientific and uh, intellectual movements that uh, co contributed to what is now often described as the decentering of man from him, from his hitherto sovereign position in the scheme of things, a uh, decentering which involved psychology, social change and politics uh, as well as uh, um, religion. In psychology, the destabilization was a product of the growing, growing perception that the self is a plural, unstable entity and yet the troublesome uh, 
realization that this plural and unstable entity has become crucial in the authentication of certain kinds of essential knowledge. In confronting these problems, their philosophic goals were not dissimilar to find and articulate significance to bring individuals in society to a richer and a larger view of themselves and their destiny. The relationship between Yeats's quest for unity of being and Eliot's nostalgia for an un, for an uh, undissociated sensibility would repay a more detailed study than I have time for here as indeed would the question of why and how both saw Puritanism as a key factor in undermining this condition. Both saw the necessity for authority in both, both, in both cases discipline without regimentation and both are good that any authentic community must ultimately appeal to a religious sense, both were aware that in the modernist age psychological uh, in, um, intuition must be an important constituent of belief, but both were worried by the danger of mere eccentricity and solip, uh, solipsism, uh, solipsism that, uh, that, uh, that this threatened. Their concerns are therefore similar, but their temperaments different. Deprived of the simple faith of his childhood, yet plunged into theosophy and the golden dawn, the problem for him, as for the Romantics and indeed for Eliot, was to authenticate private movements of seeming insight, seeming insight by relating them to universal truths. Yet a self-styled last romantic placed his hopes in his in the passionately engaged imagination sanctioned and corroborated by those movements and ideas, theosophy, the golden dawn, spiritualism, which seemed to offer a sort of inside track to, to illumination. There was in all this, as Eliot noted, something willed, yet as an avid reader of Blake and Shelley, believed in the value of passion and energy as paths to understanding and like Blake, never doubted that the road of, road of excess lead to the palace of wisdom, but yet was not, as he himself ruefully confessed a natural visionary or mystic. His unpublished visions uh, notebooks, the first started significantly uh, at the very time when Freud was embarking on his research for the interpretation of dreams, bear witness to his elaborate uh, attempts uh, not only to analyze but also detect uh, his dreaming status, states. Yeats wanted to believe that individual consciousness is a part of universal power which he variously designates <coughs> designates as anima mundi, prim, uh, primum mobile, mobile, uh, mobile or god concepts uh, which in his theology um, derive from uh, platonic rather than Christian sources and which he desperately wants to access. His poems of the 1890s uh, of the rose and the wind among the reeds are full of the desire for some revelation, a revelation that he seems perpetually on the brink of attaining the everlasting voices. Voices that cry of uh, a remembered but unattained para paradisiacal uh, Edenic state, the secret rose.
uh, which will bring with it the passionate ecstasy of spiritual illumination, but which though urgently and elaborately invoked leaves the poet still waiting at the end of the poem, still wondering, when will my hour come and round at last? Eliot's approach was apparently much cooler. He too was haunted by revelation, but his revelations were not willed or even at first desired to the very end, uh, very end they remained unattended movements and he was fastidiously cautious about questioning their origin or interpreting their meaning and yet one might argue that there was far more of the genuine mystic in Eliot than in Yeats. In this respect he was, as he himself understood, closer to Tennyson but unlike Tennyson, he subjected such experiences to rigorous intellectual monitoring and retained an abiding suspicion of what he calls the inner voice, unmediated by divine grace. His early poems, those uh, uh, now published in Inventions of the March here, are haunted by such bleak uh, epiphanies, silence. O oh, little voices, and the first debate between body and soul, and by the gulf between quotidian, uh, quotidian triviality and ultimate meaning as in afternoon. The ladies who are interested in Assyrian art gather in the hall of the British Museum. museum the faint perfume of last year's tailor, tailor suits and the, and the steam from drying a rubber overshoes and the green and purple feathers in their heads vanish in the somber Sunday afternoon. So, as they fade beyond the Roman statute, a sta uh, statuary like amateur comedians across the lawn towards the unconscious, the ineffable, the absolute. The details, even to the modish, ex modish expression tailor suits, are exact and economical and the tone Laforgian, Laforgian, but the final line uh, owes less to Lafogue than to Francis Herbert Bradley, whose philosophy was the subject of Eliot's doctoral dissertation. It is the apparently absolute gulf between the absolute and the mundane that haunts and anguishes Eliot and in his early poetry for all the apparent flippancy of the ironical or even clownish mode which he uh, borrowed from from uh, from borrowed uh, from Laforgue for all his philosophic skepticism there is a real torment something something uh, something far more disturbing far more profound than Laforgue uh, if uh, registered The young Yeats had faced similar problems in attempting to articulate the, the ineffable and found a recourse in the iconography of the rose and a symbolism based on uh, Gaelic myth and esoteric and folkloric sources. But he does not share Eliot's apparent uh, res resignation uh, in afternoon. The juxtaposition of the banal and the sublime are an intentional and, care, and carefully work effect in the uh, trite normality of the afternoon of some cultural and religious artifacts of ancient civilizations are reduced to objects, mere objects of disinterested contemplation rather than 
as Yeats would have wanted them recognized as the repositories of a still potential ancient wisdom. As in so many of Eliot's early poems, neither thought, neither thought uh, nor language can uh, bridge the gulf between, bridge the gulf, uh, uh, gulf between appearance and uh, reality. Eliot bought F. H. Bradley's uh, appearance and reality in June 1913 and found that the philosopher uh, too was concerned with the gulf between hints of the absolute and everyday experience. Bradley debated in urban prose the question that Eliot had agonized over in his recent poem, Oh Little Voices. But as Lindell Gordon eloquently puts it, uh, uh, puts it Bradley's attraction for Eliot was not intellectual, daring, but graceful intellectual, graceful intellectual poise with which he accepted failure to know final truth. It was characteristically just this detachment with, uh, which uh, Apple reads uh, in a footnote to a vision. He commented disapprovingly that Bradley found it difficult to reconcile personal, personal immortality with his form of absolute idealism. And besides, he hated the common heart and arrogant uh, uh, sapless man. This view, shorn of Yeats's aggressive, uh, uh, aggressive uh, rhetoric, aggressive rhetoric was not so very far from Eliot's uh, later estimation of uh, Bradley. While he would never have thought of Bradley as arrogant, and although he continued to admire his a scrupulous respect for words and meanings. During this period of anguished intellectual uh, questioning, uh, yet lurked, uh, per, uh, lurked perplexingly, even uh, irritatingly within Eliot's skin. And he attempted in two reviews to pluck the heart of his mystery. In summer of 1918, he wrote a short uh, notice of Per Amica Silentia, Silentia Luni for the egoist and in July, for an egoist and in July 1919, a mere puzzled and puzzling review of the cutting of an agate, which appeared in the uh, Athi. Athenium under the headline, A Foreign Mind. Although a never weary of Yeats says voice in his attempts to grapple with uh, Per Amica, uh, Eliot uh, finds its, uh, its uh, accents uh, strange and cannot fashion fathom his argument uh, through all its mazes. Eliot thinks he can understand the first part of the book, but uh, is quite lost uh, in the second part, Anima Mundi. Yet he confesses, is lost to me in some delicious soft mind as that in which Venus uh, enwrapped her son, and yet as there is no one else living, living whom one would endure on the subject of gnomes, hoboglobins, and astral bodies, we uh, infer some very potent personal charm of Mr. Yeats's review of consciousness and Christ. Six lectures on Krishna, Krishna, uh, 
uh, ethics, Christian ethics. Eliot also commend, uh, Eliot also commended Yeats's dictum that it uh, that it uh, that it is not permitted to a man uh, who takes up pen or chisel to seek originality for for passion is his only business his increasing preoccupation with the question of tradition and individual talent found this challenge to originality for originality's sake appealing sake appealing in an essay on Stendhal, uh, Stendhal and Flaubert of 1919, he stressed that uh, the two novelists uh, were men of far from than the common intensity of feeling of passion and that it was the intensity precisely and consequent uh, uh, discontent with, uh, inevitable, with inevitable uh, inadequacy of actual living to the passionate capacity which drove them to art and to analysis. In a review of Yeats's father's letters, the previous year he had applauded uh, the old man's observation that poetry is truth seen in passion and was particularly struck by his comment that the poet does not uh, seek to be original original but the truth a reflection says Eliot that strikes through the tangle of literature